I believe that we are live. Uh, welcome, welcome, Mr. James Alexander or Alexander, the Kalahari Madala. We are super excited to uh, be chatting with you. Um, for those of you guys watching that don't know, uh, James did, did the Dakar last year in 2021 in the Malamoto class. And he really, really made sure that uh, he kept us on the, on the edges of our chairs. Um, I remember I was traveling through the Eastern Cape at that time, actually training. And every night I couldn't go to sleep because I kept on watching <laughs> what James was doing in the dunes. So James, you had a really epic, epic experience in, in Dakar. And I think before we jump into this year's Dakar, what we want to discuss, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your experience last year and what your big takeaways was from, from Dakar and especially from Alamoto. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks for inviting me onto this, this Zoom chat and hi to everybody. And uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about um, uh, the Dakar the first the first time. Uh, everything about it is is difficult. Mm -hmm. It's it's difficult to, to to qualify. It's difficult to raise the funds. It's difficult to to get there with the COVID issues. And uh, but a big thank you to my sponsors and everybody and all my mates who helped me to get there because that basically without if you. Hello. Mm. We seem to have. Uh, it's hard to put it into into words. Mm -hmm. And and um, it's it's yeah it's hard to put it into into any kind of words so quickly. But uh, yeah, oh, the, the, it started off very well. The first four days, um, I had uh, luckily not any issues with the bike at all. Incredible mm -hmm. machine built by Bart at, at Bass Racing. Mm -hmm. He was actually um, on yesterday, know, we chatted with Bart. Oh, nice, yeah. nice, excellent. Um, the best the best possible team for mm -hmm. any privateer to go to go with, and I'm glad I did so. Mm -hmm. um, built a beautiful bike, uh, which wasn't so beautiful at the end, mm -hmm. but I, uh, I managed to get the bike back to Botswana, Bart agreed to, to sell it. Mm -hmm. um, which, which was, which is just very special to have the machine. But going back to the event, um, it's all what, what I learned the hard way um, is it's all about attrition and um, it's all about conserving yourself and uh, and and getting pacing yourself. So certainly at my level, uh, pacing myself the best that I could mm -hmm. physically and mentally. It, it draws on just everything you've got. Um, it, uh, it 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 targets any weakness that you might have. I had that uh, a very silly crash in the rocks on mm -hmm. the first day, which did a lot of damage to the bike, um, and I damaged my left hand, and uh, fortunately not the throttle hand. And uh, I just uh, it's amazing how the body bounces back, mm -hmm. and uh, that you can just that just keep going essentially, and that uh, was something I really learned about myself. Um, you know, particularly getting caught in the dark in the dunes. Mm -hmm. We all, uh, we all remember on. those. Uh, <laughs> we remember yeah. those. And I think that that's something that where you stand out for me, because I mean, in the clips that there were of you on the Dakar uh, um, show, you know, you were, you were really giving it to us as it was, you know, you, were, you, you weren't uh, yeah. hiding your feelings. And I think that raw emotion came through and, and maybe that's what endeared you to, let's call it, Southern African fans. Um, and basically, from what you're saying, I, I know um, Joey Evans told me once, and actually we're chatting with him next week about, you know, once once something goes wrong, like your hand or a lip or something, it only gets worse. So, so your goal has to be to not have anything go wrong and just keep yourself on that even keel. And, I mean, I remember... Um, and, and I still, I would be interested to know what was wrong in the end is you had that wheel issue. And I, I think having a front wheel issue, I mean, that, that made you so tired. I mean, I remember following you every step of the way. And I mean, I know what it feels like to fight that bike that you can't ride in the dunes and you still basically pulled the bike through that stage, you know, but I mean, I can only imagine how tired or how dead you must have been. 
what was wrong with the bike in the end? Well, yeah, I, I, I was, uh, I went through the first four days. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't bad at all. The first four days I was finishing in the daylight. Mm -hmm. um, I think I kind of really let myself down, um, not knowing the bike and having only ridden it the day before the event started and mm -hmm. nothing to do with the bike. It's a magnificent bike. Um, and I pinched the front forks. Uh, change the, the the wheels on night of the of night four basically mm -hmm. and i definitely um upset the handling of the bike and that gets inside your head and if you let it get to you um i then spent that huge day on day five um uh, and right into the night uh, it was it was um uh, ended up uh, uh drinking some tea with the guys <laughs> in the juice and uh, and that that was what was uh um you know, a lot of people, I, I think a lot of people probably might have thought that I was having a big social in the dunes mm -hmm. with everybody, but it was actually a desperate situation. Mm -hmm. I hadn't, uh, uh, I'd run out of water and food mm -hmm. and I was really exhausted. You know, I'd lifted the bike maybe eight or nine times mm -hmm. from really silly crashes, actually. And you, your concentration is gone because after that seven hour barrier, I know from being doing some endurance sports, other sports that beyond the seven hours, you or it can be different for different people, but mm -hmm. you, you start to really um, lose the plot mentally. So I, I really wanted to get to these guys. I could see their fire up on up on the ridge on this dune bank that we were going through, and uh, it was it was basically um, uh, I got there and, and 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 they really sorted me out, and I really needed their help. Uh, I only had about ten k's left, and uh, yeah, it, it, it's it, it's it's hard to explain. Um, you know, it's, it gets pretty cold late at night, mm -hmm. so you can't, you know, you, you, you can crash and, 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 and as long as the bike is semi-upright, you can stop and have a bit of a break, but a couple of minutes later, you need to get moving mm -hmm. again because the cold, because you're sweating so much, mm -hmm. the, kit is, the kit is pretty much wet and, uh, it's and that, that really, you really learn something about yourself, eh? <laughs> I tell you. I can imagine, <laughs> and I, I think that's why, why we all do it, just like push us. And I, I think you've you've proven to yourself certainly that you know you can put yourself in the toughest situation and and you will come out on the other side. And I think that to me, I mean, following your journey along, you know, that last stage, I I had never felt a more collective bedonnerheit from a bunch of uh, Southern Africans than I did that night. You know, and and I can promise you, you were in Saudi, but. All of Southern Africa was like, just ride, don't care, don't worry about what they say. And, and I think, you know, that was like the cherry on the cake to to kind of yeah. prove this, this like resilience, you know, you know, like I didn't come all this way to like be barred on this last stage. I won't do it, you know, and, and I think that that is like for me with all the hardness, I mean, and, and clearly you suffered so hard through that, but that was like, okay, you know what? I'm done suffering. I'm just going to do it. And I mean, that's, that's a memory that I think will stay in Southern African Dakar history for a very, very long time, if not forever. You know, that's, that's the kind of reasons you go there. So you re definitely made sure yes. we had a good story. Yeah, that was quite interesting because it, it wasn't that late. It had just got dark and, uh, you know, I got to that road crossing where the control was mm -hmm. and it was just a, a miscommunication with the languages and they just, they were, yeah, they were, as people know the story now, it was basically recommending that I stop and I said, and I, I was absolutely focused on finishing. <laughs> um, I remember after sending that message out and, and disappointing so many people, Mm -hmm. I remember a lot of the riders came back to me uh, and said, no, there's no way you can stop, you know, mm -hmm. just, just and, and it was exactly how I felt. And I just forced their hand a bit. And mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, after much dialogue on the radio, um, I mean, I was climbing on the bike and the guys at the control were, were firmly on my side at the stage and they were filling my pockets with uh, odd bits of food and, and we'd already filled my water jacket and I was... I was just saying to myself, you know, I've done it before. I'm just going to go up into those dunes. And there was one big one looming because the lights are really good on the KTM. Uh, yes. You can see quite far. And uh, and I could see the first one looming out of the darkness. I, I thought, well, here we go. You know, just resigned <laughs> to the fact that 
And uh, then the one guy comes rushing across, shouting and yelling. And I thought, oh, well, they're, they're definitely going to stop me now. And they uh, they said, no, 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 you can go around. They'll, they'll incur maximum penalty. And uh, mm-hmm. it was still quite a quite a journey, though. It was mm-hmm. uh, it was a good distance to get to get um, to the boat in the dark. And uh, I recall that that I went to bed after eating. It's very important to sort yourself out um, before the bite. And uh, after after eating, uh, I went to bed at two a.m. Sure. And that was the night. I actually I never struggled to sleep. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, you were dead asleep before your head hit the hit the non-existent pillow. <laughs> and uh, I, I basically um, I battled to sleep that night because of this last. It's you can't believe it's the last stage. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can't believe it. you're still in it. And and. Um, I don't know what percentage of people finish their first attempt at Malimoto, but uh, I don't believe it's very, very high. And mm. uh, and I was really hanging on by a thread. And yeah, that last stage, I tell you, Willem, that last stage, you know, <laughs> you, you would think they would make it a memorable stage and give you some nice, easy riding, you know. Mm. And they put us through these the big dunes with like knotty grass. So you mm. couldn't get momentum. As yes. you know, it's all about momentum getting over those dunes. Otherwise, you just dig yourself in, and uh, and I, I remember trying to get across these big dunes, and then um, uh, uh, those wadis, those stone wadis that went on and on. I didn't know there were so many rocks in that country, a beautiful country, of <laughs> course, and uh, and it just went on and on. And a lot of that, a lot of that stone riding, you have to stand, and um, it's exhausting. And and then, of course, twenty k's from the finish, were in the last. 20, 30 k's. They put us through a rock garden mm. that took me ten. It took me an hour to do ten k's. Sure. And I remember being, I remember being quite hacked off actually. The mm-hmm. last ten k's, it opened up a little bit, but it's like they Why? weren't going to let up on us. And, uh, <laughs> and I can't remember finishing. Uh, people have asked me, "How did you feel?" I mean, you expect to be overjoyed, and I was just felt this massive relief, and mm-hmm. I was actually a bit annoyed because I couldn't believe the last. <laughs> But then the last twenty k's, but of course your mind's playing tricks with you at this of stage. Course, because you're so exhausted. Yeah. And uh, I took uh, six microdol in that two hundred odd k stage because my right arm, that the tendonitis was by that stage was was spectacular yeah. because you're fighting a losing battle with yourself. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, a couple of more days, I don't think I could have done it. Mm-hmm. You know, I really don't. Um, well, and you're just fighting this attrition, you know? Exactly. We were actually, I was talking to um, Alfie Cox yesterday and we were discussing about the Dakars of old, you know, how, you know, 12, 14 days, you know, those last two or three, four days is where the big differences come in. Yeah. But, I mean, look, I'm super happy you made it. I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's always good to, to be able to draw on, on the experience of, of wiser guys that has been there. And I'm sure all of the guys in, that's planning to go will, will still speak to you again. But jumping into what's happening at Dakar right now, today we uh, got this very sad news that Ross Branch decided to withdraw. And I mean, you guys, so for the viewers that don't know, Ross, um, John Kelly and James are both from Botswana. So Botswana, or all three of them, Botswana is really kind of stepping up in the in the Dakar world. And um, I mean, it's really devastating news because we all will him to the end every year and every year something happens. So, I mean, we're all heartbroken for him. Yeah. Um, but you know, last yesterday when I heard that they were going to be racing on the car section, I I had my doubts because I mean, you you would know how torn up it is after those trucks and cars go through there. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what they were thinking, but it was kind of inevitable that guys would get hurt today if if you were riding on on yesterday's track. Um, but what's your feeling about what you're saying, like? unfolding in Dakar, what's your hopes for John? Well, you know, um, Willem, I, I'm staying with some great friends here, and when we were like, watching last night, I, I said to everybody, I cannot believe that, that, that they're going to put um, uh, the, the bikes down a used route. I mm-hmm. could not believe it last night. I actually I mean, went to thinking about it. I thought, this is madness. It's um, when I, I've just watched a little bit of it um, 
on TV tonight and the odd clips that we're getting. Yes. And it reminded me so much of what I had to write, and that was my fault. I was mm -hmm. at the back. I'm not blaming anybody else other than myself. But mm -hmm. it really brought it home to me where, where you saw where Ross had crashed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way the dust fills up those, those long ruts that the mm -hmm. trucks make. And you rail the bike in one of those at, at speed, and it's, it's, it's terrifying because mm -hmm. you can't actually see where the wheels are going. And um, I, I just, I mean, just looking at those overhead shots of the, the way it's all torn up like that and how you've got to ride on the edge of the, uh, either the left or right of the, of the stage. Exactly. And uh, yes, that's, it's okay during the day. Um, and, uh, but at the, the sort of speeds those front runners are doing and uh, I mean, forget about at night, you can imagine what that's like at night. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, it, but during the day, I, I just was... It's just a real cruel twist of fate that's mm -hmm. happened here, mm -hmm. and uh, and that they neutralized it at a hundred odd k's in, and it's just mm -hmm. I, I feel for Ross, man. No. But, you know, he was he, he he and I have obviously spoken a hell of a lot, and he was a great mentor to me, the best in the world that you could ever have, and and we always spoke about strategy at their level mm -hmm. of how you set yourself up and try to survive the first week and the first half of the second week, and then the real risk-taking starts in the last three days, and he set himself up exactly for that. He, he was um, doing, he was know, precisely on track for that, exactly, and it's like, like you said, it's Absolutely. just a very cruel twist of fate that it literally happened, like, and, and also just after the neutralization came for the other guys, I mean, that's, um, yeah. it's really no, sad, it's, but... That's the sport, eh? That's why we do it. I'm glad he's okay. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that's look, it. you've got your Kalahari, Bainam, and we've got the Rosses, Bainam. So we're going to have to come up with something for John. I, I've been racking my brain, but we can't call him the Botswana Pulcher. So I don't know what, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do. But um, obviously, you know John from Botswana as well. And I think the guy's doing absolutely amazing in Malamoto. But I mean, you must... You must feel such a kindred spirit with him having gone through Malamoto yourself. Um, do you actually miss yeah. being there? Do you miss the pain and the suffering? Or do you enjoy uh, watching it through the eyes of the TV screen? It's my first time, I guess. I've always watched Dakar all my life. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this is the first time after having done one to mm -hmm. very strange to watch from the TV. I must say it looks spectacular from overhead. You kind of think to yourself, <laughs> Was I really there? I mean, yeah. the scenery looks looks incredible. I mean, when you're when you're at ground level, it's it's another story altogether. But just going back to John, uh, I was with John at Kalahari Rally and mm -hmm. uh, was overjoyed that he managed to win it and, and and get the entry to Dakar and so forth. And he is John. Let me tell you, when we did it, when when I met yourself and we did it in 2019, the Kalahari Rally, yes. John took to the navigation. He's very very good. Apart from being an extremely high-level rider, mm -hmm. uh, I, I tell you, I've got really, uh, really holding fingers for John in the Mali Moto category, and uh, and I believe that he can do extremely well there, mm -hmm. even on his first outing at, at Dakar. He's got mm -hmm. such a level head. He's got the he's got the navigation. I couldn't believe how quickly mm -hmm. um, he, he took to it the first time we went to, came to Kalahari in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I tell you what, uh, he's he's. Um, He's got a, a real future there in, in that particular category. Yeah, I... And, uh, yeah, I mean, he must be getting fit, but, uh, but he's, on, he's, on the right, um, mm -hmm. he's on the right track. He's on the right trajectory. I, I fully agree, and I think we, we, he's coming into the race day quite strong. Um, my prediction yesterday for the top guys was that they're going to push today. Uh, so that because they want to go into the rest they're in a strong position and for the Malamoto guys they just wanted to finish but you know coming to John's side uh, he was at um, in April he came to us as well in uh, with the event that we have in the crew just um, as a exercise dash you know just more social kind of thing and um, he had a bit of bike issues but when he was riding um, he was by far the fastest guy and best navigator but unfortunately had his bike issues so having seen him go on to Kalahari and, and, and doing so well there really excited me for Dakar and, and I think it's such an overwhelming experience to go there as Malamoto but I think coming into the second week he's going to definitely come into his own 
and uh, we're going to see some interesting things happening in in the stand not just the standings just in in everybody's camp because as you know you know everybody has their own fights and their own battles you know at these races everybody is fighting some battle so uh it'll be very good to see him going forward yeah ab absolutely he's um he's uh, he, he he's going to have a good rest now um get a chance to really work on the bike because that's you know it's amazing how people perform when they're under mental and physical stress you know mm -hmm. the i, I can't it, it's it's hard to explain you know when you you know you sit in you're in the dark there trying to trying to sort the bike out and you can end up the following morning on the liaison i actually stopped a couple of times to, to, to check the bike that did I tighten this did I tighten that mm -hmm. yeah, and, it starts uh, playing it's, tricks it's, on as your you mind. know a very cruel cool sport <laughs> uh, big time absolutely <laughs> so, um, but so, John's is good with his he's good he's ideal for Malimoto because he's also very good with his hands mm -hmm. he's good mechanically which you need to be mm -hmm. and so I, I think he's uh, I'm, I'm going to be very interested in the see what happens in the second half mm -hmm. here I love that he's got his blue um, overall uh, I saw yeah. the other day, it's like, yes, sir, no. <laughs> that's me when I'm riding a Landy, not when I ride a KTM, but, <laughs> you know, um, tell me, uh, there was something I wanted to ask now about, um, oh, so when last year, it uh, who, who, which other South Africans was in Malamoto with you last year? I'm trying to remember, or Southern Africans. Uh, as far as I know, it was just uh, um, my... There was um, only Ross and I mm -hmm. that went across. But as far as Malamoto um, so was night. concerned, uh, in the in the Malamoto class, were you the only guy from Southern Africa doing the Malamoto last year? I believe so, mm -hmm. and um, and it was it's nice to see this year. Um, um, Sharon and Bradley and all the guys mm -hmm. all, all mm -hmm. uh, a great a good attendance mm -hmm. coming out this year. Um, and that, that's what I want to, to kind of to tie. That's what I want to kind of tie into your experience because I think being alone in Malamoto will be a very, very lonely road. And this year you've got Werner Kennedy, um, you've got Sharon, you've got Stuart, you've got John, and they're already bonding together. And, and I think the challenge of not having fellow ha friendly faces that you know um, or that can help you hold the bike or do this or do that um, is much harder. So I think it's great that, that they're a little posse this year that, that's kind of helping each other out, which is which is great. Yeah. The, they've um, absolutely, uh, that certainly helps a lot. I have to say, though, that the guys running the money, the crew mm -hmm. themselves, absolutely, and guys, and of course, you meet people, everybody the sort of type of people that are there at Dakar, mm -hmm. you know, in all the classes. Um, but in Mali, in Mali Moto are, are very uh, generous with their time. Uh, the, the guys are, um, of course, they had uh, Ross there um, in the second half mm -hmm. um, with the moral support and so forth. And it's just, yeah, it's just, I've always said it, uh, the one thing I really saw about Dakar was the, mm -hmm. the, the, the quality of, of the quality of people's uh, of people there. I mean, the quality of uh, just it's just it's hard. I don't know the exact words. I mean, it's, it's just lacquer. It's, it's lacquer means so. whether you're the crew, whether you're the organisers. Yeah, lacquer. Yeah, it's a use we a just have to be a good oak exactly together. It says it yeah. in one go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and and I, you know, especially, I, you know, I was, I, I got to know. Um, NASA, for example, in the start shoot every day, and they just, you know, the, the, the top end of the sport are just really, really high quality people. They've got time uh, for you. They no are and graces about themselves. Mm -hmm. it's just um, unbelievable. And maybe I think it's because of the the dangers involved and the and this, it's a sort of no nonsense approach to the sport mm -hmm. by by everybody doing it. There's mm -hmm. But just, I just don't think you, people have the energy for for any nonsense. Basically, it's just it's just get in there, get on with it, and do it. You know, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's something that's how you get it that done. I've really taken from it, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it, 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 incredible sport, absolutely incredible. It's hard, 
you know, people have, have you know, I've, I've sat and had a really amazing lunch with Joey Evans, who mm -hmm. I hadn't met um, until after Dakar. And uh, we were sitting and talking about all our experiences and all the, the, the people who helped us along the way and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And we both agreed, where do you go from here? What's mm -hmm. the next thing? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, going back uh, to, to do another one mm -hmm. is certainly high on the priority list. Um, being a privateer, it's largely money that stops you, mm -hmm. as, as is the case of so many people. And uh, But it, it's hard to find something else mm -hmm. in, in the world that would top that because mm -hmm. it's just a, it's a... It's just everything about it is hard. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it doesn't cut you a break pretty much all the way through, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're on this massive high for two weeks, mm -hmm. and then you come off this thing. Oh, it takes a couple of days. Your body realizes the day after, um, a couple of days after the event, and we were so quickly back into Botswana. Your body wakes up early in the morning and it's it's ready you're for ready more punishment, go. but <laughs> it finally realizes that it's over. You know. Yeah, look, I've it's actually, incredible what the body can do, actually. It is. I've, I've, uh, I think it's. I've wrote a piece, or I, it was something that I said or, or talked about about this, this idea that, you know, as rally racers, you we we suffer from a kind of post-traumatic stress, you know, and and it might not be PTSD, but it's certainly something because when you're in it, it's absolute hell and. Two weeks later, you know, or maybe two months later, you start making plans for your next race. And the, the people who love you, the people around you, is like, why would you do this? You know, why would you submit yourself willingly and pay money for this type of suffering? And um, and I guess that's what that X factor is that makes us different as far as in camaraderie is concerned, is that racing with other people are uh, people who understand that you know it's not people that's asking why they people that just say we understand why you do it because we do it as well and that's where you get that that bond from so but listening between the lines um our time we're getting uh we, it's getting close up there but it definitely seems to me that uh it sounds like we are expecting a, a reappearance of the kalahari madala at some point in the future at Dakar, is that is that your plan? Is that what you're looking at? Well, you know, um, Philip, I've, I've had a, a very very good feedback from the from the sponsors and from my friends, and 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 I've had calls from people from all over the world, uh, mm -hmm. which was amazing. Uh, I uh, I kind of bought a portal into Dakar. I mean, went through the cell phone. Mm -hmm. that gave people um, a, a really nice insight into it. I did it originally for my, my friends and my sponsors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I believe also a lot of people said it, it lifted them a lot during this, the whole COVID um, drama that's going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I have such a love for the sport. You know, you ask yourself, uh, professionals will go back to try and win it mm -hmm. in the different categories. But us weekend warriors... I would go back because of the sheer love of the sport. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just uh, really humbled by it all. Mm -hmm. And it was so nice to take, kind of take everybody with you. Mm -hmm. And that and that really helped me. I, I tell you, it, it really did. Um, mm -hmm. I, I could feel it. I had no time to look at the phone at night, mm -hmm. but I could really feel that, uh, that I had the whole of Southern Africa and a lot of people around the world behind me. Mm -hmm. And it was deeply humbling. And I'm glad that I could bring it home for everybody. And it's mm -hmm. very special to have that medal. Mm -hmm. it's um it's it's uh it's very surreal and you, there is a there is, it takes you a while i mean it took me a couple of months physically to to come right and the mental side of it is also um that peak, that post-traumatic um stress disorder i don't know we, can, we too, can call it post-traumatic uh, rally disorder <laughs> PTRD. Yeah, exactly. that's <laughs> what i should have used yeah. <laughs> it's you know you've done things that perhaps you wouldn't normally do on a bike you know uh, you, you've taken some serious risks. Um, it's it's changed you as a as a rider definitely, and a, perhaps mm -hmm. as a person, it's changed the way you think about things. Um, you, you've you've certainly pushed yourself beyond what you ever thought you could do. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, um, I, I would I would love to go back. I would love to go back. Um, it, it takes a while uh, to to to, to, recover. to to overcome it and mm -hmm. to to really think about it and. Uh, I know I've got so many great people that would back me to go again. 
and I would I would love to bring it to everybody again. Mm -hmm. That's based yeah. I would That's like to touch. Where I, am with it. I would like to touch quickly on something you you mentioned that you know taking risks and I mean that's something that that people ask us a lot you know about how do you justify the risk but more out of a rider's perspective not not out of a theoretical perspective um, when you were riding were you were you feeling that you were taking risks out of the option of you know you're just riding too fast or the like you have to ride fast to get to make the cut of time or was it more a question of of taking risks in the ability of, of, of your riding uh, skill at that point like how in which sense would you say you were taking risks and how did you justify those risks by pushing the limits uh, I, I know it's a difficult question but I'm very interested in the in the mindset of, of how do you like get how do you overcome those challenges if the question makes sense you know it's yes it does it's a good question it's in it's in different layers and it's sort of yes to all of them basically you you need to be above average rider to go to one of these um hence the the, the vetting process of of qualifying to, to get in there um you we are all competitive people and we want to do the best we can you are pushing yourself all day to, um, for the time bars, the odd time bar that they put in and, that, that, um, and so forth. But I think the, the spookiest one is when, you, when you're when way beyond tired and mm -hmm. uh, in the dark and you, you're trying to get uh, through a, a really bad section and the worst was the rocks and the dunes and the mm -hmm. sand mixed together. And uh, I spent the one night trying to get up this one pass and there was no way around. Mm -hmm. um, and I did things on a bike that I didn't think I could do. <laughs> but um, it was just, <laughs> I, I was, um, because you just know that's, that's the end of your, it's the end of your race. Your yeah. car. You can't get through there. Mm -hmm. But and in, yes, at the beginning of the day, the, that, that particular piece of, 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 of the stage would, you would have ridden up pretty, probably pretty easily, but by the time it's been all ripped up like that, Mm -hmm. And that's that's where you sort of think later on, a few weeks later, geez, did I really do those things? Mm -hmm. um, but that's all part of the, you know, you, you kind of, um, you accept the risk. Um, it's what we love doing. Mm -hmm. you, you feel really alive doing it. And, uh, you know, you, you, you could also argue, you know, I've had, I've had some people say, but, you know, is it not irresponsible doing, doing these sort of things? I said, well, you know, you could be you could be taken out on a highway somewhere um, in exactly. the dark. I, I mean, it's, it's it's you know you, it's it's a it's a it's a calculated risk. I mean, we're wearing a lot of safety equipment. Mm -hmm. I tell you that air jacket. Mm -hmm. The Alpine Star guys were really interested in my air jacket because they said I, I was <laughs> the first to reach fifteen. You know, I, tested, I was the first to reach fifteen blows on it. And lucky I wasn't paying for the bottles in the back because they're quite expensive. I can but, imagine. But yeah, um, you know. It's it's uh <laughs> you know the, the safety equipment's there. It's a calculated risk. And, uh, it's it's a know, it's, I, I wouldn't. It's a mitigated risk in a controlled environment, and I think that's it. And I think that's that's the thing is you and like you the, the scenario that you explained. You know you have no choice. I mean you have to get to the end anyway. So even if it means the end of your deck, are you still have to get over that path? So w whether you yeah. push it and you you carry on or whether you you don't carry on you still have to get over it um yeah. and and you know we, you choose to put yourself squarely in in that challenging position which is again why we love the sport so but look our time is running out so it was super interesting i would love to chat with you all the time it's much better to talk around a fire um so hopefully we will see each other in the new year i don't know if you have any plans for april maybe you'll come down and join us um and um thank you for all your contributions and we really look forward to kind of uh, seeing the kalari madala at one of the new dakars hopefully i'm i'll see you there at some point as well so yeah it would, it would be good to see you going back again and i'm sure you'll have lots of support from everybody in the southern african side thanks Willem. thank you very much and thank you for everything you do for our sport i would love to come down to one of your navigational uh, the training uh, uh, sessions and because uh, uh, that's one thing where I'm, I'm very bad with I've got to really step up on the nav side because it's as we all know it's a, a great percentage of the sport mm -hmm. of course yeah. and 
Yeah, you only you only allowed to come if you bring. Uh, uh, um, John introduced us to KTM Diff Oil. Apparently, it's something that you guys brew up in Botswana. So <laughs> I don't know if you're no, part I... of that crew, <laughs> but you can join if you bring <laughs> us some KTM Diff Oil. That would be that would be spectacular. That, that would be yeah yeah. That's let me add that. And yeah, thanks thanks for um for asking me to do this. Uh, to come on mm -hmm. the Zoom Zoom meeting and uh, yeah, man, it's the time pleasure. of year and for thank it. You to, yeah, and thanks thanks to everybody out there, and uh, it's it's just been a, a heck of a journey, and uh, hope, hopefully we can do a chapter two for everybody at mm -hmm. some stage. Definitely. Well, enjoy your friends, enjoy the Cedarburg. I'm very jealous, and uh, we will catch up with you at some point. Let's see how the rally shakes up. Thank you very much for your time. Brilliant. Thanks, Willem. All Thanks, the best man. to you guys. Happy 2022. Yep. Stay well. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye for now.